I'm David Skidmore, and today we're going to be introducing a new stroke type, the single independent stroke. A single independent stroke is when one mallet in one hand strikes the marimba, and the other mallet in the same hand remains stationary. And to produce this stroke, you'll rotate the wrist, sort of like you would do if you were turning a doorknob. Let's start with the number four mallet, which is the outside mallet in your right hand. We'll be using a piston stroke just like we've been doing in all the other lessons. So you'll start with the mallets positioned above the marimba. Now in slow motion, rotate your wrist such that the number four mallet comes down to strike the marimba, but that number three mallet right here stays stationary. That's the motion that you're gonna use. The big trick is to keep this other mallet from moving. So you don't want it flopping around, you don't want it to get in your way while you're playing, you don't want it to make unwanted sounds. You want it to stay as stationary as possible while the other mallet is playing the single independent stroke. You can use your other hand when you're practicing to hold this mallet that's not being used. This unused mallet is just resting gently in my hand um, and it's acting as a kind of a reminder to myself that it shouldn't be moving. And it's getting me accustomed to what it feels like for this single independent stroke to happen on this mallet while this mallet is not moving. Now let's try the number three mallet, which is the inside mallet in your right hand. And the exact same principles apply. You want to create a wrist turn so that this mallet strikes the marimba and this mallet stays as stationary as possible. So start in slow motion and get used to what this wrist turn feels like. Once again you can use your other hand to steady that outside mallet. You kind of have to um, get clever with how you reach this mallet without getting in the way of this mallet but you can kind of reach like this and hold this mallet while this mallet plays a single independent stroke. Once again, this other hand is just sort of acting as a reminder that this mallet shouldn't be moving. So you're not squeezing this unused mallet really hard. The unused mallet's just resting in this other hand while you're uh, practicing and getting used to the, the feeling of the single independent stroke. Your other hand works exactly the same way, so be sure to practice uh, the left hand just as much as you practice the right hand. In fact, if you are right-handed, you should spend more time practicing your left hand. If you're left-handed, you should spend more time practicing your right hand. We're all either right-handed or left-handed, which means that we've got a strong hand and a weak hand. And we spend our entire lives um, turning on light switches with one hand, or opening a doorknob with one hand, or writing with one hand. And that means that that other hand is always going to be a little bit weaker. I've been playing percussion for over 20 years now, and I still have to spend more time practicing with my weak hand than with my strong hand. It's a lifelong challenge to um, be able to be just as strong with your weak hand as you are with your strong hand. Now let's move on to the exercises that are in your book. Warm-up exercise 1A is pretty simple. It just asks you to play single independent strokes with one mallet at a time. So notice a few things. First of all, I'm still using that piston stroke, which means that the mallets are starting above the notes that I want to play. You'll notice that I'm using a turn of the wrist to create this single independent stroke. And you'll notice that, for the most part, the other mallet in the same hand that I'm playing with is not moving. Repeat each measure of this exercise about five to ten times as you're getting started. And you can pause in between 
uh, each measure of the exercise if you want. Just really focus on one mallet at a time, get really comfortable with this new stroke type. Warm-up 1B also asks you to focus on one mallet at a time, but now we're moving around the instrument so we're not staying on one note with each mallet that we're playing. You'll notice, of course, that uh, this exercise draws musical material from the etude that's a part of the same lesson. That's something I tried to do in all the lessons that are in this series, so that when you're learning notes in your exercises, you're kind of like already learning some of the notes that you'll need uh, to have for the etude that's a part of the same lesson. So you'll notice that I'm pausing in between each measure of this exercise and you don't have to do that but you're absolutely welcome to do it. Um, the most important thing is that you're using this exercise to get better at uh, whatever is new to you, whatever feels less comfortable to you right now. So if you want to take one measure of the exercise and repeat it five times but the next measure you feel super comfortable with, move on, you know, only do it one or two times. The really tricky thing is that you want to spend more time practicing the things that you're not good at, and less time practicing the things that you're already good at. It's a very common tendency for any student to spend a lot of time on something that they're already good at, and to skip over something that doesn't come to them as easily. But the best musicians are the ones who spend more time on the things that they're not naturally good at, and less time on the things that just come to them really easily. If you spend time on the things that are hard for you, then eventually they'll become easy for you. And then you'll be able to do everything, which is really what you want to be able to do as a musician. You want to feel super comfortable with any technique, any musical scenario. Both warm-up 2A and 2B ask you to first play for two measures, both hands, at the exact same dynamic level, mezzo forte. And then for the next two measures, you leave that melodic line at mezzo forte, but the other hand, the hand that's playing the accompaniment material, that hand uh, is brought down to piano, so that we're bringing out the melody and bringing uh, the accompaniment material to the background. Now you'll notice that I'm accomplishing these different dynamics just by using stick heights. Remember always, stick heights equal dynamics. So if you will just focus on what height your sticks are playing at any given time, that will take care of bringing out the melody or bringing the accompaniment back into the background. Even though the first measure of the etude that's a part of this same lesson is marked mezzo forte, you should play that music the same way uh, that you're working on in Lessons 2A and 2B, bringing out the melodic material and bringing the accompaniment material to the background. You need to start recognizing in the music you play what part is the melody and should be in the foreground and what part is more accompanimental and should be in the background and adjust your dynamics accordingly. And this, of course, is true not only of the exercises and etudes that are part of this video lesson series and the book that uh, accompanies this series, but it's true of any piece of music that you'll ever play. You really need to pay attention to uh, what is the most important thing to hear at any given point in a piece of music. And if it is important, you need to bring it out a little bit and bring everything else in the, in the musical texture back into the background so that that most important line can be heard. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to also watch the video of my complete performance of the etude from this lesson. And we'll see you next time.